we can put the computer here? Yep. I think we need to plug it in. We've got this power strip going. And then did um, Allison give you clicker? Yes. Okay. Clicker. Awesome. She is the good clicker. The science always starts clicker. <laughs>
It's the button that seems to do it is that like you hold shift and you can scoot it ever so slightly one way. Yeah. Interesting.
the stars. If this is your first time with us, we are a graduate run talk series um, that happens every second Thursday where you get to hear one of our grad students give a talk about the science that they do, the science that they love, and then you get to tour this beautiful um, 
field station we have so close to campus. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Umat Samji. Umat was born and raised in Kenya. He decided to go to a much colder Vancouver, Canada for college. There he attended uh, Simon Fraser University and got a degree in ecology and evolution. He then returned to warmer weather to get a master's degree in entomology at University of Florida in Gainesville, where he subsequently got a PhD there in interdisciplinary ecology. <laughs> um, he then had a Tupper postdoc um, that he completed at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And now he is a Stangle Wire scholar here at U Texas, um, where he's studying some weird but wonderful bugs that I'm sure he'll talk to us about today. Traveling seems to be a thing that Umat's really good at. Um, lately, PBS has taken him around the world to film some parts of an uh, upcoming documentary. He's been in New Zealand to film rhinoceros weevils. He went to Kenya to film elephants. And he just recently got back from Northern Thailand um, filming rhinoceros beetles. So without further ado, uh, I will give it over to our very jet lagged but always enthusiastic Umat Samji. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, I gotta stay on this side. Hello? <laughs> Um, okay, so I just noticed real quick, uh, part of the screen here is, is a little cut off there, so if there's something there... Wait, 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 wait! Oh. Hello? Is it working? No. I think this is the last spare, so I'll try not to do the same thing. Um, but thank you all for coming today. I'm so excited to talk to you about animal weapons. Um, I noticed a little bit of the screen here is cut off, so if there's something that shows up there that you want clarification on, just um, raise your hand and, and let me know and I'll talk about it. Um, so today I'll be talking about animal weapons, the evolution of tusks, horns, antlers, and other signals. So we know that... <laughs> That's supposed to say animal weapons. <laughs> but we know that mating competition shapes the evolution of a diversity of animal weapons, from the massive tusk of elephants, to the looming antlers of elk, to the elongated necks of giraffes and ossicoins on their heads, to the... Oh no, sorry, I'm trying. Okay. <laughs> to the forward-facing horns of uh, rhinos. And these structures have captured our curiosity for a long time. Some of the oldest cave art depicts the massive flaring antlers of Irish elk, or the elongated necks of giraffes, or these massive tusks of mammoths, or these large horns in woolly rhinoceroses. But of course, weapons are much older than that. A recent study looking at trilobites suggested that the horns, these trident-like horns in trilobites, were likely shaped by competition for mating opportunities. So males would use these horns to fight each other for competition for mating opportunities. And that is 400 million years ago. So if this is right, it would be the oldest weapon ever discovered. And that's quite profound. That means that weapons are older than trees. And a recent paper also showed that these large, these extremely large tails in Ankylosaurid dinosaurs were likely used and shaped by competition for mating opportunities. By looking at the damage on the armor plating of their bodies, they suggested that these dinosaurs likely went side by side and fought, whacking each other with those giant tails, just the way that weevils do. And I'll show you some weevil battles later. And 
Um, so animal weapons pose so many questions. Why are they? Why are so many weapons so large and so conspicuous? We know, for example, that weapons that are used to incapacitate prey, like the claws of lions or their canines or the fangs and snakes, are not necessarily very large and very conspicuous. But the big flaring antlers of this Irish elk are. Uh, why are some <laughs> weapons invisible? And what are the weird and unlikely parallels between human boxing matches and weevil competitions? So these are some of the things I'll go through during my talk. Every once in a while, we get a really cool news article like this, where some residents in Alaska found two moose frozen in the lake, locked in combat. <laughs> um, and so moose are some of the big, have some of the biggest weapons we have today. But truly, the price for one of the largest weapons in nature must go to the elephants. Male elephants use their massive tusks to fight for mating opportunities. And they do this during a very short period of the year, during musk when testosterone levels are high and you can literally hear the sound of their tusks clashing and it echoing through the savanna. And of course, there's been a big long history among the proboscidea, the group that contains elephants, which have different shapes and sizes of weapons emerging from the lower jaw, the upper jaw, sometimes both, um, and all this diversity of weapons. So a question for the audience here, how big are the longest tusks that were ever discovered? How big do you, I'm about five foot six. Anybody, you can yell your guesses. 12 feet? 8 feet? 20 feet. 16, 20? Um, the answer is about 16 and a half feet, yeah, five meters. And that comes from Zagalofodon Borsuni. So can you imagine, that is a single modified tooth attached to the skull of this animal. It's truly enormous. Okay. Um, and if you go to the University of Nebraska, you might be able to see this fossil of mammoths that were locked in combat and preserved for 12,000 years, um, locked in combat. So. Sometimes we can get this amazing window into the behavior of animals so far back into the past. And in this case, this suggests that these animals fought just like modern day elephants do for mating opportunities. We also have enough evidence from mastodons, for example, to have enough male mastodon tusks and female mastodon tusks. And it suggests that male mastodon tusks were much larger, much thicker and heavier than female mastodon tusks. And just like modern day elephants, dentine doesn't, grows, um, doesn't grow continuously, but it's laid down in these periods of rapid growth. So it grows continuously, but it's laid down in periods of rapid, rapid growth, which result in rings, the way that tree rings form um, in trees. And a group of researchers studied the rings in the tusk of a mammoth. One cool thing is that not only dentine is deposited into that structure, into the ring during growth, but so are the hormones that that male has in its body during that time period. And the researchers were able to find these peaks in testosterone that were seemed annual, um, which suggests that these mammoths had these peaks of testosterone and underwent musk, which was that intense period of mate competition that modern day elephants experience. So one question is, why are many of these weapons so large and why are they so conspicuous? While skill might be important in fights, the best, the best predictor of fighting outcome is mass. And we know that because whenever we see boxing matches or UFC fights, we see them placed in very strict size categories. And there's also another reason Weapons might evolve not just to fight, but to communicate relative size. And we think this is the case because many weapons exhibit positive allometry. So what is positive allometry? This is a male Hercules beetle, and males use these elongated horns on the front of their head to fight. 
And in this case, a small individual here is a scaled down version of a big one. The scaling is proportional. But this is not what we see in nature. This is not what we see in nature. <laughs> this is what we see. As individuals get larger in size, they invest disproportionately more in these sexually selected traits. So this brings up the question, why is it that large individuals often invest disproportionately more in those large horns compared to small individuals? Okay. Okay, I'll try to talk into the bike a little bit more. Um, so question for the audience, this one should be easy. Uh, which deer species is bigger? The one on the left. Yes. Okay, uh, let's do another one. Which deer species is bigger here? Right, okay. Um, what about this one? The one on the right? Same. Are they, yes? Same. Same, maybe, okay. Well, it turns out that it is the one on the right, but only by a very little bit. But what I did is I depicted deer here without positive allometry, without those antlers getting disproportionately bigger in a bigger individual. If we had deer of the same size and I included that positive allometry of the antlers, this is what you would see. So those antlers exaggerate the size of an individual and it's a lot easier to tell how big the one on this side is relative to that side because of that positive allometry of antlers. Um, and um, I encourage you to talk to Larry Gilbert here, who is one of the world experts on deer antlers, and he's carefully collected and curated the antlers of individual deer throughout their life over nine years um, and has their skull. So you can see the ontog ontogeny of growth of these antlers um, in a display here at BFL. Okay, that question is, what animal is this? <laughs> Guesses? Saber-toothed tiger. Saber-toothed tiger. Saber-toothed tiger. Saber tiger. Okay. It's actually a Chinese water deer. So a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of these deer have these massive tusks. And we can see that some deer species have just tusks. Other deer species have tusks and antlers, and other deer species have just antlers. And of course, most extant, extant modern deer we know have these large flaring antlers. One of the smallest deer species we know to exist today is pretty small, about the size of a small dog, like a pug, and it has tiny pointed antlers that account for one-tenth of one percent of its body mass. While one of the largest deer species we know to have ever existed, uh, the extinct Irish elk, had these massive, had these massive flaring <laughs> antlers uh, that accounted for more than 10% of its body mass. In fact, across species of surveys, large individuals invest disproportionately more in antlers compared to smaller species. And one of the largest species of deer we know to have ever existed, the extinct Irish elk, had these huge flaring antlers that were more than 12 feet across. I love this quote by Stephen Jay Gould, who is a naturalist, and he says, they have, ser they have served as gateposts for the homes of Irish gentry and as temporary bridges to span rivulets. So imagine these antlers were used as little bridges to cross small rivers. It's Amazing. <laughs> but today we know the cervid or the deer species with the largest antlers is the caribou. And you might think that because it has the largest weapons, it might engage in the most fights. Well, somebody studied this and they looked at more than 1,300 male competitive interactions. And out of 13, over 1,300 male competitive interactions, they observed only six fights. So fighting seems to be extremely rare in the species with one of the biggest weapons relative to body size. Males would often 
do these sparring contests instead, where they appeared to touch their antlers, and this might be a way to assess relative size of their opponents. Those six fights happened between individuals that were relatively evenly matched in size. So weapons might evolve to signal size to ensure competition occurs between evenly matched opponents. There's this quote from by Sun Tzu in The Art of War. It says, it is the rule of war. If 10 times the enemy's strength, surround them. If equal, engage them. If weaker, be able to avoid them. And I think an animal that demonstrates this principle most clearly is this very small and very little known tusked weevil. In this weevil, males have these tusks that they use in competition for mating opportunities. But in between those tusks, there's a little pit. And if you have a drawing of the weevil, that pit grow is has a sheath internally inside the weevil body that would fit the tusk of an opponent. So this is what those sheets look like inside. So these are the tusks that are external here, the horns. There's the pit, and this is a sheath inside its body. So you can't see this. This is a like done by dissection. Small males have little horns and small sheaths. Medium-sized males have medium-sized horns and medium-sized sheaths. Large males have these large horns and large sheaths. Because, because to compete with, for these weevils, the horn of an opponent has to enter your sheath and vice versa, that's how they get locked into a position where they can participate in these drawn out fights. Individuals can only fight in this prolonged way when they're relatively evenly matched in size. So this creates a situation where small weevils are only fighting small weevils. Medium sized weevils are only fighting medium sized weevils. And large weevils are only fighting large weevils based on just the morphology of how their bodies fit together. And if you think about it, because weevils are fighting in the dark, this species is fighting in the dark, and because they have poor eyesight, most of their communication about their relative size occurs through tactile stimulus. In this case, whether their horns fit or do not fit into their opponents. And this is incredible because in a way, small individuals are fighting with small individuals and large individuals are fighting with large individuals. So we have this um, interesting parallel between human boxing matches and the fights of weevils. I'll talk a little bit about some unusual weapons. Um, narwhals have these large tusks that go apparently off the screen here um, that can be more than 10 feet long and they're actually an elongated canine tooth and it's usually the left canine that gets elongated and it's most often in males. But every once in a while, a female has that elongated canine, and every once in a while, a male has both canines extended. And this is the strap toothed whale, which has two um, tusks that emerge from the lower jaw and wrap around its top jaw. Um, in fact, it wraps around so closely that the male eventually gets gape limited. So the way the, the amount that a male can open its mouth decreases by about 50% in these whales with these teeth tusks that go over their upper jaw. But one of the most interesting whales are these beaked whales, where their weapons, these tusks and knobs on the skulls, occur inside their body surrounded by soft tissue. And so this was a puzzle for a while. Why would males have these weapons that were not visible, that were not exposed? Um, but it turns out that uh, whales communicate through ultrasound and they can see through each other's bodies. And so as living ultrasound scanners, they can see each other's weapons through their bodies and they might be able to communicate 
relative size and the size of the weapons through their bodies by looking at the more dense skeletons. So we know that weapons are found in diverse groups. They're found in the multiple horns of bovids, uh, the antlers of cervids, the many modified uh, appendages and structures found in fish, the structures found in armored dinosaurs, and many prehistoric mammals. But by far, weapons are the most diverse in insects. And that's probably because insects are the most diverse group we know. So we know that weapons are extremely diverse. We talked about the horns of rhinos, but we know there are horns in rhinoceros beetles, the antlers in elk, but there are these little flies in Papua New Guinea that have antlers, and only males have antlers, and they fight just the way that elk do. The tusks in elephants, and the tiny little tusks in tusk weevils, the elongated necks of giraffes, and the extremely elongated heads of giraffe neck weevils. And because weapons are so common in insects, that's the group that I study. This is one of the groups of, of insects that I study, the leaf-footed bugs, where males have these exact, exaggerated hind legs that they use in competition for mating opportunities. Um, and they vary quite a lot in relative mass. So some of them are less than 3% of body mass, and other ones account for one-third of their entire body mass. So, a third of their body mass are these large, heavy, muscular structures. Am I running out of okay. One of the um, insects that I study is the heliconia bug that has these large weapons. And when we look into the structure of the weapon, we see that it has these extensor and flexor muscles, it has trachea to supply those muscles with oxygen, and it has high mitochondrial density, suggests that it's an energetically costly trait to maintain and produce. I also work on New Zealand giraffe weevils, which, who have these elongated heads they use in jousting-like competitions for mating opportunities. One other amazing thing about them is that they have this huge size variation. The smallest male can be about 30 times smaller than the largest individual. So if the smallest male was the size of a person, the largest individual in the same population would be the combined mass of two adult giraffes. This is what a New Zealand giraffe weevil egg looks like at eight days old. And this is an adult male. On one hand is a small male, on my other hand is a large male. I also worked on jousting weevils, which are related to the New Zealand giraffe weevil, but they're, they're quite different. They're found in Central America. And they also have a remarkable range in body size. And you can see their heads, that elongated part of their body, that weapon accounts for a huge proportion of their body size. This is a female who's drilling in a log and the male is guarding her. So she's gonna drill into this log with her head and she's removing little bits of sawdust there. And she's gonna turn around eventually and lay a single egg into that hole. And then she's gonna cover that hole up and walk away and start drilling for another hole. The male in the meantime is just guarding her. <laughs> These are two males fighting. And there's a female drilling there in the foreground. <laughs> and these are two males fighting. And you might be wondering, what are these little tiny males doing when these large males are fighting? <coughs> and here's a little male hiding underneath the female. <laughs> so I've studied uh, the elongated heads of giraffe weevils, 
the large legs found in these bugs um, and the elongated heads of the jousting weevils. And what I found is that these structures are important, these weapons are important, but so are the muscles, so are all these supportive structures that these animals use to wield those weapons. And this brings me to a more general point. When we think of the big tusks in elephants, we know that like larger elephant species invest disproportionately more in those structures compared to smaller elephant species. But we don't really pay attention as much to their internal morphology. We know that to support those tusks, elephants have to have these large head muscles, which also scale with positive allometry, so they're disproportionately bigger in large individuals to carry those disproportionately longer tusks. And we know that many of these sexually selected web bands are composed of metabolically inert tissue, like the keratin found in the horns of bovids or the bony antlers of elk or ossicoins of giraffes, or the dentine found in elephant tusks, or so much of the modified cuticle found in so many different insect species. And with that, I'd just like to end with this little video here where this small male is mating with a female with this large male who just notices <laughs> so, uh, if you are interested in animal weapons, there's some really great popper books available. Um, by Doug Emlin. One is Animal Weapons, it's more general. Another one is specifically more about beetle battles. Um, I highly recommend them. Um, and thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Tooth whales are alive. They're very rare and hard to see, um, but but they're apparently they're still roaming the oceans. What's the point of that adaptation? Um, so we don't know how they use them, but many species have scars on their body suggesting that they use them in, in competitions. Um, but it might be that they're using them mostly as signaling structures towards each other. Yes. Yeah, the question is about hammerhead sharks. Um, that is such a good question. I know very little about hammerhead sharks, but they do have some very fascinating um, morphology that I'd love to learn about. That's such a good question. So the question about the whales that have soft tissue covering their, their weapons on their heads, um, and the question is, um, why is that beneficial? So it, it might be beneficial to signal size to other males. So it, it provides a better signal of size to avoid more intense competitions. Yes. So the question is, can a narwhal have more than one tusk? Um, and the, the answer is yes. Um, you can look this up online. You'll see, usually it's only one tusk that's elongated in narwhals, and it's the left one. Uh, but every once in a while, you get a narwhal with both tusks elongated. Yes. 
Could you repeat the question? Sorry. So the question is, do animals with horns tend to engage in combat more than animals with antlers? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think we have enough information to, to, to say that, but that would be a great study. Oh, I'm going to go way over here. Um, people are missing out on this end. Um, yes. Oh, so the question is, what are the tusks and the deer for? Um, and, well, we think that the tusk and the deer served a similar purpose to antlers. They were used in competition for mating opportunities. So we think that's the case because there were very large males had much bigger versions of them compared to females. And they also scaled with that positive allometry, something we see very commonly in weapons. Good questions. Yes. The question is, uh, does every animal have a weapon? Um, and that's such a good question. And, and the answer is um, no, at least not something that we call weapons. We see animals fighting all the time and they don't have weapons. Butterflies, for example, will fight all the time and they don't have specialized structures to fight with. Um, so yeah, not all animals have weapons. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, boys fight, but do girls fight? Um, so um, yes, most of the time in, in these structures, uh, males are engaging in competition. Uh, in the weevils I study, uh, most of the competition are between males, but about one in every four competitions are between females. So females um, often fight with each other. In, in the case of the weevils, they're fighting for territories for reproductive opportunities. Um, there's a number of antelope species where females fight with each other as well. So, so yes, males fight with each other and females also fight with each other in many of these species. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there are a few species of rhinoceros beetle that are native to Austin, Texas. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was a question about whether rhinoceros beetles are native here. Yes. Uh, so You're nice. <laughs> That's a, a good question. So the question is, um, if there was a beetle that had a, that was small but had a disproportionately large horn, was fighting a beetle that was larger and had a disproportionately small horn, how would that fight go? Um, would they fight each other? Um, and what we see is, although uh, there's a little bit of variation in the relative size of horns, it follows that allometric pattern pretty closely. So very large beetles typically also have very large horns. You don't get that very often. It happens sometimes. Um, and that's probably, that variation is probably where the differences in fight outcome come about. So sometimes these fights are not very predictable. And it's probably why um, fights do occur in many species, even though they don't may not occur very often, many of them do occur engaging fights. Yes. So um, that book that I, I mentioned, Doug Emlin's book, um, talks about weapons in humans. Um, and he talks about it from a cultural perspective. So he talks about the evolution of battering, ra battering rams, how uh, the, the keels of ships got increasingly modified to be much bigger. The whole structure of the ship got bigger with uh, increasing number of rowers in the ships. Um, and the whole, there was this kind of arms race between the evolution of the cultural evolution of these battering rams. So there's some good um, things about human weapons in that book. Yes? Um, why don't um, the same deer fight with um, the same animal? 
why don't the thing dia, why don't dia, like, from the age, have things like the one that on my day? So, um, the question is, I think, uh, why do most deer not have fangs, but most of them today have antlers instead? No. No. Um, why do most of the ones, why do the, some of them today have antlers, have fangs and antlers, but the ones in the past don't have the fangs? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, why do some deer today have both these elongated canines and antlers while um, some other species just have elongated <laughs> canines? Um, and it might be because having both antlers and canines provide better signals of competitive ability. Um, and they might be less, it might be less, relatively less costly to have antlers or their, their better signals compared to um, those elongated teeth. But that's a that's a very good question. Yes. Wow. What is the coolest animal I've ever seen in the wild? Um, I I think those tusked weevils are one of my favorites. Um, they are very very small. They're about the size of a grain of rice. So they're the type of insect that if you saw it on your shirt or something, you just brush it off. But once you start looking at them with a magnifying glass under a microscope, all these details emerge. You see those tusks just like elephant tusks. You see that hole where the tusks can go into. So so those those tusk weevils are probably my favorite. So where are they native to? They're native to Central America and South America. Yes? So the question is, uh, do animals um, who can't see, do they fight? Um, and, and that says yes. So, you know, the example I gave with those tusked weevils, uh, they fight in the dark. And so they have to judge each other's size by touching each other, by tactile stimuli. Um, so many animals that don't have very good vision will compete in different ways. Yes. Good, really good question. So the question is, are there any other uses for these weapons other than fighting? Um, and and that, that is very true. Um, you know, elephants will use their tusks to strip bark. Many bovids, many antelopes in Africa will use their horns to defend against predators. Uh, I mentioned the caribou, which has the relatively largest antlers of any cervid. In those and it's also the only survey where both males and females have antlers. And females will use their antlers and will keep their antlers longer into the winter, and they'll use their antlers to defend their calves against predators like wolves. So yes, weapons tend to have multiple functions once animals evolve them. Yes? Why, why do the, the deer have like, longer teeth? I, I, this is so great because I love the way that we're, a, lot of, a lot of people are fascinated by the deer. Um, and so we know that tusks have evolved multiple times in multiple different animals. You think of uh, pigs having tusks, hippos have tusks kind of internally, have, have teeth, tusk-like teeth internally. Um, but the question is, why do these deer have these tusks? And so deer use those tusks to fight with each other just the way that uh, many deer species use their antlers to fight they use the tusks for fighting yes so the question is is there an evolutionary advantage to have a huge to having a huge size difference um, in those weevils, for example. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. We find that size differences in adults of most species are very rare, big size differences, especially like that. The average size difference in most non-social insects, in adults of most non-social insects, is about 
um, three times. And the size difference in those weeples is 30 times. So it, it really is a puzzle. So the question is, what happens when an animal's weapon falls off? Um, and I don't know if you look online, but you'll be able to see some videos of like moose shedding the antlers. <laughs> There's this one video where a moose sheds its antlers and it shakes its head and it looks like it's terrified and it runs away. Um, and they, like um, deer species, grow the antlers every year and then they drop them every year. But antelopes, um, bovids, will grow their horns slowly and steadily throughout their life. And if their horn gets damaged, if they break a horn or if it falls off because of damage, then they can't grow it back. Um, so it depends on what type of weapon you have, uh, whether you can grow it back or not. All right, we have time for one more question. I think there was one in the back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the ratio of the weight of the weapon Um, so, so the question is, the relative mass of these weapons, um, as they increase for larger individuals, is it something you see across different animal species? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and, and the answer is, you see that pattern occurring within certain clades. So you, you see it within deer uh, species, and within corid species, or leaf-footed bug species, and within Brented weevil species, which are the giraffe weevils and the jesting weevils, and within stockite flies, for example, and multiple. So within a group where you where they have the same structure, you see these patterns emerging, where larger individuals invest disproportionately more in these weapons compared to smaller individuals. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much, Uma. And I hope you all join us next month to learn about how we can use math to fight climate change. So thank you all again. Man, the mic was terrible. Yeah. That was the loudest it would go. I screwed it up because I broke the first one. <laughs> no, I, no yeah. I knew there was one that didn't work. Yeah. So we just had a little Oh, wow. That is so cool. I think I think that one's called an ox beetle. Uh, it's huge. Look how big it is. And it's got... An ox beetle. And it's got these, these three horns. Nice, good find. I we have been looking. Oh, really? Right in our garden. Uh, two days in a row, one no after way. the other. Yeah, yeah, I think those are native. Okay, that's have you interesting. Used, there's a um, a really. I, I've actually uh, keep been keeping my eye out for them, and I've never seen them in Austin. So that's lucky that you got to we see them. We still have them. <laughs> yeah, if you want them. <laughs> <Yeah>. Collection. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can come to my house and see two of them on my bucky board. The bucks that I found. Have you, have you seen, there's a, like an app by iNatural, it's called Seek. Oh, no. And all you do yeah. is you yeah. kind of hover yeah. over yeah. the yeah. insect yeah. and it identifies. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And then you can just press a button and yeah. it posts it to oh, iNatural. Yeah. Uh, and so what I do is I look at things people have posted to yeah. see where, where things are. Where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, well, what is it called? Uh, Oxbeetle. Oh, no, the app. Oh, oh, the app. It's called Seek. S-E-E-K. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's by so it's iNatural. Awesome. Oh, that was yeah. embarrassing. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. That's a very weird bug. Oh, that's hilarious. I was I hope you could hear me. I actually don't know if I have the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. We're we're both taking work, planet Earth. Oh, okay. Cool. Oh. For me, it's like. 